Thank you so much, Mia. Um, I'd like to thank you all who have managed to join us this evening um, for this fantastic discussion that, well, we think it's fantastic on Linware, uh, collectible art pottery. Uh, Strauss and Company will be selling 45 lots from the David Hall collection, uh, which is on view at Valchement all this week. And just to give you a little bit of a background on the collection, it was been, it's been assembled over the last 60 years. And you're probably thinking, goodness, is Mr. Hall that old? But he was a snipper and a little tiny boy when his interest was sparked. His family had a very, very close connection. His aunt, uh, Phyllis Turk, um, her husband was Harold and he was the company secretary um, for the Cullinan family. And his mother's brother, Noel Stevens, was the CFO or the accountant there. And he was always trying to keep the Cullinan family in the style that they were accustomed to. So Mr. Hall grew, grew up eating off these lovely Linware plates and drinking from the various goblets. And everything that you see in this collection is extremely familiar to him. Um, we've joined today by... Uh, some enthusiasts and obviously experts. We have Dr. Melanie Hillebrand. Um, she's the retired director of the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Museum. And she was the director there for the last 29 years from 87 to 2016. She's also the very well-known author of The Women of Olive Van Steen, South African Studio Ceramics. And we have Esther, Esmeral, who I've known for many, many years, and she's the curator of the social history collections, together with the William Fur collections at the castle. Mm -hmm. And from the pure enthusiast and love of Linware, we have Mike Bezaza. He um, sits on many boards and many trusts, including the Cape Heritage Trust, the Naval Trust, and he's a member of the Irma Stern Trust. My colleague, Sophie Louise Frulich, will be running and looking after this whole presentation. She's not only one of our, our youngest auctioneers, but she is a generalist like myself with a passion for ceramics, silver and furniture. So over to you, Sophie Louise. Thank you so much for that introduction, Vanessa. That's lovely. And of course, we need to introduce you as well properly. So Vanessa Phillips is the Joint Managing Director of Strauss and & Company, and she is um, the Head of Department for the Decorative Arts, as well as the Jewelry Department, and very well known and respected within the auction industry. So we can't talk about ceramic studio and linware, which is the focus of this collection, without mentioning Uli Fons Fontaine. So we have here a wonderful painting by Thelma Newlands Curry of the kilns and workshops at Uli Fons Fontaine a photograph in the corner, as well as a lovely advert on the right hand side. So Esther, will you take us back in time and take us to the beginning? Yes, um, thank you, um, Sophie Louise, for your preparation of the slideshow. Um, yes, we're looking at the bottle kilns and the workshops um, at Olifant's Fontaine, and um, Mike will tell you stories later on about Olifant's Fontaine, but it was a very remote area in the middle of, uh, 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 situated between Johannesburg and Pretoria. The premises belonged to Sir um, Cullinan, um, and he was a diamond mining magnate and a rand lord. And he had a brick company, and he also wanted to establish um, a factory. And he started this, which they called Transvaal Pottery, around about 1908. It did not last very long, um, around 1914-15 it came to an end. But while he had this Transvaal Pottery at these premises, British potters came to work there. Um, so when the Transvaal Pottery came to an end, all these workshops and accommodations and kilns were abandoned. And in steps, two ladies, two young women, South African born women, Gladys Short and Marjorie Johnston, and they rented the premises from Sir Thomas Cullinan. Um, Marjorie Johnston um, 
did not stay very long at um, uh, the ceramic studio. She married into the Cullinan family. But these two ladies started um, a pottery, a production pottery called the Ceramic Studio. And just before we go into the details um, of all the ladies that worked there and their backgrounds and their inspirations, just in short, the Ceramic Studio operated from 1925 to 1942. In 1943, the Cullinan family, or Conrand, the business of Sir Thomas Cullinan, um, took this business over and changed the name to Linware. Linware then started officially in 1943 and lasted till about 1962. There's not 100% clarity among researchers whether that is the end date, but we will, we will take uh, Dr. Wendy Gers's um, recent book. Um, and she, she uses 1962. So yes, there is a picture of Gladys Short. Margaret Medley is at the bottom and at the right bottom, Audrey Frank. Five women started this business. They were all trained at the Durban School of Art and also at the Royal College of Art in London. Why do we have Dora Billington? <laughs> Melanie? <laughs> Point okay, for you yes, to it, explore. It, she, but she would have fitted in with a ceramic studio, wouldn't she? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just, just to give some more background about their training, um, the Durban School of Art was a very. Uh, oh, let's go. Ooh, too fast. Too fast. Let's go back. There, there we go. They, when they attended the Durban School of Art, which was the precursor of the um, current uh, fine art school at the uh, University of Kwasulu Natal, but in, in, the, in the days before um, the fine art uh, college, oh. which was set up in Peter Maritzburg, the Durban School of Art was actually begun in about 1908. And these, uh, the two, Gladys Short and Joan Methley, who was the, the two co-founders, they attended the Durban School of Art when, uh, when the headmaster was John Adams, uh, who came out and uh, attempted to instill a, a, a craft pottery um, teaching environment. And, but of that, he left, he actually, he, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, the, the Durban School of Art, the, the, their story is a little bit sad because a lot of people came from overseas and attempted to um, set up quite ambitious schemes. And he, he, when he left, he was invited to join Carter Stablin and then he became, of course, Carter Stablin Adams, uh, which became Pool Pottery. And these are some examples of his work. He was a aficionado of Art Deco in the 30s. But when he was at Durban, he taught the students basic studio pottery practice. Um, and he himself made a lot of works, a lot of very beautiful vases. He was a, a big fan of painted Maiolica ware, which he obviously taught them as well. Um, and so he was, he was a very profound influence on, on ceramic studio. If we could just go back to uh, the previous slide. Dora Billington, uh, these, these, these women, uh, some of them got scholarships, but um, they and a number of other graduates from the Durban School of Art attended the Royal College of Art in London. And Dora Billington was the lecturer in ceramics. She was a very precocious craftswoman uh, she was actually still a student when she took over teaching the pottery at, at, the, at the RCA. And when I was a student at, in Italian University, she was absolutely the, the, the person that everyone looked up to in terms of studio, studio pottery practice. And she must, must be quite a, 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 obviously, say in her 30s or 40s when this was taken, but she taught very um, sound principles. And she, the, the Royal College at that time was quite, um, they, they were still working in the arts and crafts 
movement. I wonder, Esther, I mean, you you probably know more about the arts and crafts movement than I do. Maybe we should just pop, sort of move on to, um, I think it's... We, we, we can, but before we do, maybe it's important to also say that um, this was also the time when Bernard Leach started oh, yeah. his pottery at St. Ives in 1920. And um, the women potters um, from later ceramic studio and, and were exposed to, to the, the pottery that was made in England at the time. And um, one of Dora Billington's um, important uh, views was that she went wider than, um, than um, uh, Leach, mm -hmm. which was very much focused and influenced and um, on Chinese ceramics. She embraced pottery from Europe, from the Middle East, from East Asia, and even contemporary um, currents in arts and design. So she, yeah, she was an important inspiration um, to her students. What 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 role would feminism have played at this point in time, or did that not really come into into well, it? Well, I think that was that was a you know, <laughs> it, I don't think there was any such thing. I mean, it was very difficult for women. If you want to talk about um, attitudes towards females who studied art, I mean, there's no better example than Mary Steinbank, who was a sculptor who trained with these women and she actually did a lot of work. That is an example of her work. Ooh, yes. Let's just go back to Addington. Yes. This was this was made in 1929. It's the Addington Children's Hospital and it's one of their first big projects that they did in collaboration with the Public Works Department of the government of the day. And Mary Steinbank created this uh, relief and there was a, an absolute scandal because a, pi a picture of her in dungarees on a scaffolding <laughs> installing this, this artwork was, was published in one of the Natal newspapers and people were horrified that a, that a lady <laughs> should be oh. taking part in such activities. And Mary Steinbank, um, she also went to the Royal College and studied sculpture. She wasn't allowed to actually register as a student. She was allowed to share the studio with, I have, with, with no less than Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth. <laughs> and um, she was eventually, she, she, she was never given her diploma. I mean, she's credited now, sure. but that, that was the problem that women had. I mean, it was considered unladylike. Uh, her family supported her, and I think that that's something about the ceramics. You know, this, this, you know, the women in general, they were. I think their families supported them, and I think that was important. It was not easy, and especially being able to go overseas and study. That that was something that was taken for granted. That that um, study in South Africa wasn't good enough for somebody who wanted to be a professional artist. So I'm just throwing in those those um, observations in terms of women trying to be professional artists. Uh, Maybe, yeah. Yes, Esther? Yes, um, I read somewhere that lots of people, VIPs, went out to visit um, Olifant's Fontaine. And one just sometimes wonder, was it really to buy, to look at the ceramics that were produced or were there lots of stories going around about the young women um, living in isolation in the felt um, making pottery? Um, was it big, would they have done it if, if, if it were, were main, male potters? Um, I'm just wondering. Um, I, I think it was, it was an unusual project in any case. I mean, I think it was, they were very pioneering in the sense that I don't think there were any uh, pottery studios of, you know, of, that lasted. I mean, there, there might have been certainly individual potters, but it, it, as, a, as a concern, as a business, I think they were very um, enterprising. I think you're right. I think they were, they were referred to as the girls, the girls. Mm -hmm. People would drive out in 
mm. in convoys and, and look at the girls. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a great story. <laughs> before, before we move on, is it possible sure. to ask Mike to just say something about Olifant Fontaine? I can't contain myself. <laughs> <laughs> Spill the beans, Mike. <laughs> Well, uh, my memory is, um, I, I, my dad became, my dad was a geologist and, he, and after the war he came back and he had worked for the government metallurgical laboratory and he then moved across to, uh, now here, it was Linware, and he, he was, so he was, he was involved in, he was in, um, involved in the, the, um, the, the clay aspect of the, of the, the, uh, the pottery and he, in fact, he wrote his DSC thesis. Um, when he was at what we called Ollie, and he would mm -hmm. catch a train after work, he'd catch the train from Ollie to to Joburg to go and study at Witz, work in the library until ten o'clock at night, and then he would catch the last train back to 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 um, back home. Um, Olafson Tain was very very isolated, and even as a kid, when we went back, I can remember it's not on the main it's not on the main road between um, Joburg and Pretoria. I think it's on the road to Kempton Park. But we would we would do this deviation, and and certainly um, it was very out of the way. I, I mean, these ladies, what they did for <laughs> entertainment, I can't imagine. My mom never talked about that, but my mom was very devoted to them. She she uh, when 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 my dad left um, uh, Galena Refractories, as it was, uh, she went round and she got pieces from each of the artists because. She was very fond of the ladies. Uh, she had been, they, they, were, they, they were friends. I suppose they all lived in that village together and they had, um, had enjoyed their, their time. But it was very, very isolated. I mean, cars didn't, cars always broke down anyway. So if you went from Johannesburg to Pretoria, you were sure to break down at least once. Uh, so, so going off, from, and it was a dirt road. It was a dirt road from, I think, Halfway House, which is Midrand. I presume Olyphant Fontaine now is in the middle of Midrand. But it was miles from anywhere. And there were no telephones or anything like that. You know, those sort of things didn't exist. So you 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 really battled. And those ladies must have been. I know that there was a there was a general dealer. We loved the general dealer. And we, we, he was there for many, many years later. He was on the main road and you all stopped off at the general dealer. And I presume they got everything from him. If I if I can maybe I can just um read you something from Thelma Newland's Curry's memoir about you talking about the social life. She says, and now for the social life, there was very little. We had no tennis courts. The little hall was tiny, had a cement floor and rough brick walls. Miss Frank has described it. Sometimes we had a cinema show. A man came with his primitive equipment attached a part, <laughs> attached a part to his car battery and the films were thrown onto the brick wall which had no plaster <laughs> and it produced distortions which were very funny <laughs> uh, and she talks about they used to change for dinner in the evening and um of course she <laughs> she she later married francois van Scalpate, who was the the works manager and he brought a large box of chocolates. <laughs> and uh, she, she says, she thought of London and Paris, the theaters that passed her mind in those occasions. Because, I mean, these were, late, these were all women who'd been overseas. They'd traveled, they'd lived in London and Paris. And it must have been a shock to the system. I mean, although, even though they knew that it was going to be remote, I mean, it was, must have been the middle of, to them, it must have been the middle of nowhere. Absolutely. <laughs> before, before we move away from Mary Steinbank and the Addington Hospital um, work, um, it was mentioned that the Linware, um, that Ceramic Studio and Linware had lots of uh, work, uh, commissions from, from the government of, of the day. And I think it's important to mention some of the most well-known um, works. For example, they work for hospitals, the Grotesker Hospital, um, post offices. I think many people around um, uh, know the post office 
tile panels, Musenberg, Cold Bay, Nuertuk, just around in Cape Town, but they also made them in the Eastern Cape and, and further. Um, they were work for private buildings, um, sun lawns, um, the home of the Cullinans, and also here in Cape Town, Elfin Hotel, I believe. Um, they worked for schools, for train stations, so they, they had big commissions in government buildings, but also in public buildings. The, the same the same man who, who hired them to do the um, the, the children, Addington Children's Hospital, he was responsible for those post offices as well. And I think there must have been about at least 35 post offices where you can still see those those tile panels. But I think I think the the, the the first major project was the Johannesburg Railway Station. I, I, do you know if that is still if, if that is still accessible? Or those those blue, blue and white tiles. That's exactly what I wanted to ask Mike. I was hoping that he travelled by train recently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Johannesburg uh, Railway uh, Station. Uh, I have no idea. I, I, I think I know um, the Johannesburg Heritage Foundation. If they want to get access, they have to do. They have to jump through all sorts of leaps, hoops oh. to get through. Uh, mm -hmm. it, as far as I'm, I'm aware, you, you talk about the old part of the station. Yes. The, 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 yes, beautiful the restaurant. Yes. Um, okay. As far as I, I don't think it's it, it, it's certainly not accessible to the public. Yeah. But it's very beautiful, and those things are are wonderful. Well, they wall to wall, blue and white, uh, Delft style tiles. They they were they formed the basis of quite a lot of their work. I mean, the, the interior work, because the new law courts in Port Elizabeth, um, all the toilets are, are lined with those blue and white Delft style tiles. And um, <laughs> I spent quite a few happy hours invading those spaces, <laughs> trying to find them all. <laughs> They'll be prolific. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah. Well, they, 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 I mean, it, it was set up really the, the I think we, we, if we're going to discuss what's actually on the auction, I mean, that is all domestic wear, I think, which is quite a separate, it's, it's a separate um, part of the output. I think the tiles, unfortunately, there are no tiles actually on the auction, but um, I think there's something which are accessible publicly. I mean, it, it's something that people can still go and see. Maybe one of the slides have... actually has one of those tiles, has the music oh, yeah. 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 I was going to suggest, should we have a look at the at the influences and move move on okay. and discuss yes. those? Yes. Okay, so here we have the arts and crafts movement. Of course, William Morris was a great exponent of that. The VNA and lots of inspiration. Melanie, do you want to take us through some of this? I think just to point out that the, this was what the VNA ceramics collection would have looked like at the time when they were students and they spent a lot of time there. And it's, I mean, it's, if you've been to the VNA, I mean, it's now it's in the same, it's actually in the same rooms, but it's been completely remodeled. It is the most comprehensive collection of world ceramics. I mean, you feel as if you're entering history when you walk into those rooms. And it was basically free to the public. I mean, and they would go there and make drawings and examine the, the techniques and so on. I think it's, it's quite important to say that as far as design was concerned, when you're talking about the, their design philosophy, I think they were very much influenced by the arts and crafts movement. It was, it was not, it was, it, which was started, um, I think as Esther, you pointed out, it was started as a reaction to the, the inhumanity Sorry. of factory made products and that mm. the idea mm. was that you could beautify your life by you by, by acquiring or making handmade beautiful handmade craft work and it wasn't just ceramics obviously it was it was a lot of um, there was a lot of different craft work and I have to say that all things like textile design um, uh, furniture and pottery, those were all taught at art schools in South Africa 
under the influence of this philosophy. And it wasn't an, uh, a peculiar thing. It was only after the war that this whole idea of separating fine art and craft kind of took hold. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny thing, but when you think about it, they had enormous art exhibitions in South Africa, which took place at each of the main centers. And there would be a very big craft representation. I mean, they even had cake decorating, <laughs> which is unthinkable yeah. if you think about it now. I mean, people would just laugh if you wanted to put cake decorating in an art museum. They'd think it was unsuitable. Mm -hmm. But th this is, I think this is the background that we need to bear in mind. If we could just move on. Um, yes, William State Murray actually took over from Dora Billington at the Royal College of Art. And he was also, I think he, his philosophy as well. I mean, it was, wasn't was just a uh, homespun craft. It was, it was about, as Esther, as you were saying, it was about this whole Eastern philosophy of the beauty of objects. Um, could we move to yeah. the next slide? <laughs> okay, this is, okay. I think you, you wanted to say something about... Um, um. I think it's yeah. I yes, think it, can you do you want to yeah, um, enlarge on this um, about the publications? We can move on to the publications. Sure. Um, I think it's just good for those that um, don't know that. Uh, am I right, Melanie? The first publication on the women of Olifant's Fontaine was done by yourself in association with the National, the Gallery. National, Gallery. National Gallery 1991. I do remember the exhibition and I remember <laughs> my former colleagues, Kim Sibbert, Patty Hardy. Oh, yes. It was wonderful. It was a traveling yeah. exhibition um, yeah. to about four centers um, in South Africa. So that is quite an important publication to have. And then more recently, 2015, Dr. Wendy Gerst did Scorched Earth, not just on Lenore and ceramic studios, but all the pottery production, um, pottery production studios that operated in South Africa. I, I think we really need to take our hats off to Wendy because she decided that she was going to study all the, the pottery factories in South Africa. I mean, and, and they were, they were I mean, you can see from her book, there was a considerable uh, flourishing of, of pottery, of ceramics generally, factory made ceramics. And she was, she was teased unmercifully when she presented her research. <laughs> and I was, it was a, the, the attitude was, oh, thank you, Wendy, you've done this now so that we don't have to, <laughs> which I think is very unkind because these are, the, 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 this is, you're looking at the taste of the country. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a, a history of South African um, taste in ceramics, Indeed. which is very important. And also, it, it, um, if you work as a curator in a museum and you collect um, ceramic, mm -hmm. building a South African ceramics collection, this is your go-to publication. Absolutely. Yeah. It has the dates, yeah. she has the people that worked at the factories, wonderful images. It's a life's work. It's, it's really an amazing publication. And most recently, I don't know exactly in which year, um, Duffy, Heymans, and Middleyans um, published the Olifant's Fontaine Pottery book. Mm -hmm. but also keep in mind that Rihanna Heymans, way back in 1988 at the University of Pretoria, um, did her master's thesis on the, the, the Olifant's Potteries. I, it's a pity I didn't think of asking you to do the when she was at, at our museum in Port Elizabeth, Wendy presented her MA research uh, in the form of an exhibition called in which she she featured Kalahari ware, uh, I think um, Grahamstown potteries. And she that that helped us enormously to build up our collection. I mean, yes, Wendy was instrumental indeed. in bringing those yeah. that genre of ceramics into the collection, which we now have a very representative uh, range. So we've talked a little bit, or it's been mentioned about the influence of the Oriental influence 
who would like to elaborate on that? So I've uh, just to point out the, the detail shot is actually from lot two, which is on the current sale. Um, and then the image at the bottom right is at, um, an actual Song Dynasty Chinese piece. Um, if I um, can just um, share with, um, I can't say the viewers, the listeners. Um, when I walked into Welchemiant um, last week to look at the whole collection, it was as if I was surrounded by Song Dynasty Chinese ceramics. And because you have the beautiful blue and green colors and it is just so attuned with nature, with the plants outside, with the pale blue skies of the sea. <laughs> um, and when I mentioned this the other day, Melanie reminded us, but it is the linware is so different from, from the Chinese ceramics. And maybe when we look at the next slide, we just can discuss that. But to me, I mean, that is all these wonderful glazes, but Melanie can also come in, but she reminded us that in the Chinese um, early ceramics from the Tang, the Song, Ming onwards, uh, mostly porcelain glaze we use, these were fired glazes, they were yeah. often fired in reduction, but yeah. where in the ceramic studios we had a different situation. Um, they used red yeah. earth there, am I right? And the... Um, Glazes? Um, how did the glazes differ? Uh, they, they had a lot of trouble with the clay because, because they wanted to do painted ware. Um, they, they were always looking for a pale, a pale body, a pale clay body. And in the end, what they decided, they, they brought in, they, they imported <clears throat> a very opaque uh, earthenware glaze called myolica. It's it, they you it uses uh, tin in the in the glaze, which makes it very very white, quite thick. And um, to obtain, in order to imitate those beautiful Chinese glazes, as as you say, yeah, you know, the the Chinese Chinese perfected porcelain and, and stoneware glazes, and they we usually in a reducing kiln, which, which is why they got those beautiful red colors. And it, and it was so difficult. Red is very difficult to obtain in earthenware and oxidized. Um, well, I don't want to get too technical, but basically mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> when you fire iron, it can, when it's, when it's in an oxidizing, in other words, it's, there's a lot of oxygen in the kiln, uh, it, it fires to brown and yellow. <clears throat> It, when you put it in a, a reducing kiln, in other words, you you smother the fire, and so you don't have as much oxygen, and that changes, that has a chemical reaction with the iron, and it produces those extraordinary red colors. Now, to produce similar beautiful glazes with these with these depths of, of, of color and the variations, they would cover the body with the white myolica glaze, and then they would spray on glazes with color oxides, which is why they go all drippy like that. They, mm. uh, if you, you know, the pot on the right, you can see it looks as if it's it's sort of dripping. It's, 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 it's like, almost like a volcano. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that it's sort of slowly dripping down. And that's the effect that you have that pr is produced when you, when you put one glaze on top of another. And most of their colors were obtained by using plain oxides. They, they, it was, I think it was too expensive for them to, to actually import color glazes. But um, the ones that are that familiar turquoise, uh, if we go back to the previous slide, that turquoise color, that, that, is, that is produced by copper. And if you want that turquoise color, it, it's um, most most of the time you use an alkaline glaze to get that that, that bright bluish green. Um, so I think, as you said, they 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 admired Bernard Leach and they admired that Asian tradition. But I think what they found that it wasn't popular. The, the pieces didn't sell. People wanted color, 
And if you think about John Adams and Art Deco, <laughs> they, the, the, you know, it, it was all about people, it was all about beautiful blues, beautiful turquoise, yellows, and those, that's what people wanted. Um, so I guess that's why most of the domestic wear is so colorful. And it's amazing. It's reflected in the in the current collection. Also, those stunning Absolutely. colors. Esther, sorry, I yes, interrupted. No, no, that's fine. Your lot number twenty three are three pieces that is in in in, in the current um, in yeah. the whole collection. Um, yeah. So it's the. I mean, if you look at the glazes of linware, it's. It, 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 it must have been such a tedious process. It's a little bit like Delft, isn't it? Covering, um, covering the body to create a, a white porcelain look, and then you add your cobalt blue or your iron to create your blue and your your your, your green oh. colors in the glaze. And there's all the different there's variations of tone. There's color intensities and thicknesses that that yeah. change. And this is what makes them actually so unique and I think what makes them it's what makes them so likable you know that you then why a lot of I mean in this collection a lot of the colors are represented and I think that's quite it, it's something that people find appealing and then also even within the color range there will always be variations which make them very alive absolutely yeah absolutely alive yeah so if we if we move on to glow pottery uh, and compare oh. that to linware, Melanie, you you told us some lovely oh, comparisons. Yes, I think this, is, this is actually very <laughs> this is very sad because <laughs> it, and after the war when when linware when it was revived and it was renamed linware, um, the 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 women who were still at the factory, I think they were quite sad because. They didn't like the idea of working in a factory environment, but but I, I have to say that um, it was it was more standardized. I mean the, the 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 colors I think were more predictable, and they had a lot of help from the works because they couldn't afford to import their glazes anymore. So I think that the work the Conrad chemists uh, actually assisted them greatly when they when they. Um, started producing their own glazes. I think what was sad though, is that a lot of other um, businesses started um, piggybacking on their, on their production and Globe was, was, which was a Pretoria factory. Globe um, molded, I mean, you have to remember that everything was thrown by hand at, at Linware. Um, whereas Globe, it's, it's pretty much, um, done by it. It's, I think most of it is, is, is done by molding. Mm. And they were produced in enormous volumes. And I can imagine people going into Stutterfords or Garlics or wherever in those days, you know, looking for a wedding present mm. and saying, oh, look, it's just the same, but it's cheaper. <laughs> Let's get this one. <laughs> um, and people, people often mistake Globe for Linware. But it's quite easy to tell them apart. Um, globe is not an, it's not a very regular. The glazes are a little bit less. They don't they don't have any depth of color and they don't have very many variations. And they're usually stamped with that that globe. There's a globe stamp. I think in the next slide is a better example. Okay, globe is in the is, is that in the middle. It, Linware always has a glazed base, but globe, the base is almost always white. And if it doesn't have that globe stamp, it, it would usually have a number or sometimes no stamp at all. And then mm. you had a lot of different, you know, there were a lot of different other factories that popped up also cribbing their, their color and style. I mean, Lucia Ware, you see on the left, Cycle, and in fact, they're all represented in Wendy's book. Yeah, um, but I, I think it was the beginning of the end for Linware because they just couldn't compete with that kind of factory production. And it's just interesting, quickly going back here, just for the for the viewers. This this is actually globe, and that is globe, and to see how similar the shapes are also, if you've compared to the Linware, which was under sale. Yeah. Well, they mm. they were copied. 
Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> obvious. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. And the marks. How, yeah. So this is just a slide presenting the marks um, and the different variations on a theme that, of course, um, Vanessa and I also had to to study when uh -huh. we went through the cataloging. I don't know, Vanessa, if you'd like to elaborate a little bit on, on that or? Well, I, I think what, what we unfortunately don't have a slide of is the bases, which are all scratched. And often people look at these linware bases, not realizing they're linware, but it's where the, the actual part sat in the they're called saga marks, and it's where it's the particular item sat in the kiln. So it's unfortunately we don't have that. So uh, many people are confronted with that mark. They think, what is all this scratching and nastiness? And many of our pieces have that. And um, so we were obviously trying to obviously get a chronological sense of when each mark was used. Those, 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 that, that little, sorry, if you could sorry. just go back there. Sorry, sorry. On the mid center left there, you can see those little marks and they're made by tripod stilts. Because when you sire earthenware, you don't want the, the glaze on the base to stick to the floor of the kiln. I'm just- That's just true. Little... That's true. And also right at the top, that's called the dish mark. It looks like a dish with a lid yes. in profile. Um, yeah, so that is, that's Do you it, have that any what you will usually see, hole? don't you think? Yeah. Mm. Then the LW. A, mm. I had such an argument with, with one collector who insisted that it was a hut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. It, it did confuse us as well the hat and the dish and cover and, and where we were going <laughs> so we brought it to the books <laughs> um rare <laughs> glazes um i think you all concurred that that yellow was quite a rare glaze or glaze that isn't often seen um yeah. the zico collection i believe only correct me Esther, one. has one example yeah, yeah. we only yeah. have one example um and again the range very very soft yellow to that mm -hmm. Jug with its upturned spout, which is a yeah. lovely, lovely, strong, deep yes. yellow. Um, well, Wendy Blesser found, found our museum the most fabulous bowl with that yellow glaze. <laughs> wow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is, Sweet. this is, yeah, yeah, okay, these are, this is just to illustrate, I mean, Wenger's. When I was a student, we, we used to get materials from Wenger's and you could, they're unaffordable now. I mean, look at the range. Enamels, gold, copper, silver, gilding, metal, gosh. Glass colors and stains. Hmm. Mike, do you want to jump in here and tell us a little bit more about clays and your father was involved and, and that connection from an emotional point of view, perhaps also? I think, um, I I can't add any sort of technical stuff, but you know, my dad, being a geologist and actually having been um, at El Alamein, um, he became very interested in, in clay, and uh, so the clay was 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 hugely uh, important to him, and he did lots of experiments and lots of work on it. He also came from the government metallurgical laboratory, so he he saw it from a from a very much from a. Um, uh, a scientific point of view. Um, it was quite interesting that I'm fascinated to hear that you uh, about the, the white because the, the artists and there aren't any any pieces of of the hand painted were on the sale. Those people would have had to, to to deal with the glazes in a very different way. And those are the things that my mom so loved, although we always had the plates that you that are on the sale, the sort of thing that you're going to see just now. Um, we and, and we loved those those glazes because they look. Somebody said that they trapped color, they trapped oh, light. Sorry, oh. they trapped light. Mm, they trapped it, light. It, yeah. it, that's the extraordinary part about Linware, which you just don't see. And I'm quite frankly, uh, Globe never had it. No, I've always been able to look at Globe and go, mm -hmm. well, it's flat. Flat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's yeah. not, yeah. Yeah. The, that one. That this this um, is this is Musenberg post office. The, the, the the tile on the left. And on the right, you've got the, um, I think Esther, you mentioned it, the, uh, the little sculpture at Alphen. 
That's correct, yes. A girl with a frog. That's a dolphin. <laughs> that's, that, that's Mary Steinbank and, and the book ends Is as it? well. That's Mary Steinbank. Um, she did quite a number of fountains. There was a in one of the earlier slides that fountain at, um, uh -huh. the Addington. at Addington Hospital. That was also hers. They, it's quite strange because they must have molded them because they you you get quite a there are quite a few uh, versions that that uh, that, that uh, exist. And those bookends, the Tatham Art Gallery has a pair of those, and they've been glazed with colorful glazes. Very interesting. If we just look at the linware, at, at how, I mean, it was mentioned at the beginning, all these different mm -hmm. um, designs and styles and the painting thereof. Um, I remember someone mentioned the candelabra was in a collection. I've, yes. Oh, it's in the Zico collection. Oh, there we go. It's the Zico collection. Is yeah. that theirs? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the that's in in our collection yeah. um, charger at the top left is in mike's family's collection dates from 1949 and then the um the tile with the indigenous bird the hornbill is elfin and okay. the right is also elfin that that vase is probably 1939 because there was a massive uh, fashion for depicting scenes of the of the, the great trek because of the centenary and this must yeah. have been one of those yes. mm. Mm. Mike do you want to tell us more about the plate your plate <laughs> <laughs> well, the one on the left as I said my my mom when dad was leaving um uh, then where he my mom went around and she collected a piece from each of the artists and uh they would i suppose it's difficult for me as a, because i was a very little boy and so these were part of just part of my life and they were very much part of 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 what we 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 had i, I have here i don't know if anybody can see it but I, it's a saint christopher and my mom mm -hmm. gave it to me when i was well, I see it was it's 1946, and and I don't know if that that shows up. Yeah. And and I'm I'm born in 1947, so um, yeah. I've had it all my life. And it, it they were just part of our lives. And and I loved the colours. I loved I loved the plate on the on on, on the left. Um, mm. They they were our decoration. But you later on in in the in in the sale are a whole lot of vases. And that's what you did. You you put flowers in. If you looked for a vase, mm -hmm. you found a linware vase. If you wanted a beer mug, I remember all the beer mugs in our family were were linware. We it never occurred to me they were linware. They just they were just <laughs> what we used, and they, yours, they were just Erica? things that you loved. And I remember my mom loved this so very very much. They were oh. tremendously important to her, and they became important to us. And oh. I think I said to somebody. I'm really not able to judge whether this is great work or not because it's just completely emotional as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I just love Limbley. I love all I love the glazes. I love the bar. I, I just yeah. love it. <laughs> Even Esther, where's, your, where's your bars? Where's your Oh, here's my bar. Oh. <laughs> and Vanessa, well, I, your trust. <laughs> I, I retired recently and I, I gave most of my ceramics to the art museum. Well, I couldn't part with this. <laughs> hey. see, well, I, just have, I just have to clarify that this <laughs> this was gift to me, uh -huh. um, a colleague, um, upon her retirement. So uh -huh. this is part of the museum's collection. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's lovely how you're also enthusiastic, and you can really like you can I can see you just enjoy Linware and you enjoy talking about <laughs> it. And it's, I think it's great you've each got a piece. It just makes it. Special, so lots of pieces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at these. I mean, oh, like no, it's amazing. Glorious. It's yeah. amazing. My favorite oh. is the bowl at the bottom. Oh, yes, so yes. Oh, it's unusual. Oh, I mean, they make my mouth water, really. <laughs> <laughs> I love the purples. I must say, the purples are my yes. favorite. Yeah, they really are great. I yeah, so I love the russets. 
Wait, here we go. Oh, we'll put yes. a russet oh, for you. Yes, yes, yes. And similar, the casserole dish, the lidded casserole dish is so similar to what was made at yeah. um, Eberman Pottery. Um, mm. A little bit yeah. Can I tell a story about the russets? Oh, yes, yes. please. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very nice one, which, and it was again going back to my mom. Linware we used to be, there, there, there was a Pretoria show. And, and Kalina Refractories would have a stand there. And my mom would work at the stand. And on one occasion, Roly Kalinan, um, who apparently had, had, was, a, was, a, was a very debonair and a, um, a bit of a ladies' man, came to her one evening and said, oh, Mrs. Bazazi, you've been so good to us. Don't, you know, it's lovely. I'd like to give you something. What about having this pot, this jar here? And my mother said that was very kind and um, a bit embarrassed about this whole thing. Knowing that it, in fact, had already been sold, she said that, you know, that was fine. She would, she would happily accept it. And then, of course, he discovered that it had been sold. So <laughs> he apparently went back to the, to, the, to the studio and said to them, make Mrs. Bazaza another one just like this. And she didn't hear anything. But after a while, she got a phone, <laughs> uh, not a phone call, a message from the studio to say, please, would she come? They had made something like 10 more and they couldn't get the right glaze and would she please come along and just select one and she, she was more than happy and it was in this lovely russet color um if you look at one of the plates it's it, it it's, it's much there's much more more, more of the, the the deep red red in it it's a beautiful jar and it's been part of again it's part of the family and the story is part of the family we know it was came from Rolly Killen and <laughs> he was trying to char charm my mother. I went one of my father to oh. say. <laughs> so I think Vanessa, at this point, we, we perhaps need to mention to the public also that these are actually actual lots from the sale and are up for, for auction next week, Tuesday, is it the 10th? It 10th? is. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the rostrum and I'm hoping that you're going to have a white glove sale. <laughs> um, no pressure. <laughs> yes, no pressure there. And that you'll have the joy um, of selling these to the new collectors and new owners um, who are going to be able to just enjoy these colors. Um, and they are the shapes of the vases are very beautiful. But I do hope one or two of you might even eat off the plates. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can I just say, I think. Sorry, Mike. They're to be used. Linway yes. is about it, it, it is is to be used. It's it's not it's for purpose. Mm. I'm questioning. I think, I think, Look, think of drinking beer out of that mug or a coffee. <laughs> I don't mind, but it, it's okay. it's it's part of but life. I think perhaps it, it's important just to point out that these are the only ceramic studio pieces on the sale. Is that right? Yes, yeah. those That's are the only right. ceramic studio. That's why I've left them for last. If if anyone yeah. likes to come up. My mm. favorite is the one on the right. It's such a, it's such a beautiful piece. Amazing. It really is. Yeah. And yeah, the glazes yeah. and everything is just stunning. I, I and the mark a... belongs to it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. It's the, yeah. yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. And and also the uh, the lady. Well, you can tell us because you helped us. The J. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if Mike or Melanie would agree, but it, uh, we we were figuring out it might be Marjorie um, Johnston. Um, I'm not sure. It could might have been the thrower. Um, oh. Chromie. No. Uh, Agliotti. Jane, Jane Chromie. No, he was there. He was there at that time. Sometimes the throwers do mark batches. Okay. I don't think it's Marjorie Johnson. Um, she was there just for a year. Yeah, that would have been. She left in when she got married, and that was about mm. 1926. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But I, I just, I just think that this the, in the vase is. It's a shame I can't have it in front of me because they're so individual those ceramic studio pieces, and and it sort of bears out that chance effect I mean you wouldn't have known quite often I mean it was such a it was so tricky to get the, the right thickness and so on I mean you're talking about the, the fuss of having to double glaze um, 
I think the myelica was probably quite easy. I mean, that they would have just dipped. Um, but they had to, they used a spray booth. And you can never tell how thick the glaze is when you spray it on. It, it sort of, it, it, it lands in a sort of powder with a blobby powder and, and you can there you can't tell so you'll only find out when it comes out of the kiln sure that's but amazing very special very special special and then to end off um i think i'm going to hand over to vanessa if you don't mind uh, esther very sweetly sent us these wonderful images of valkament which is where the exhibition is and um i just thought uh, brilliant way to finish off and we look forward to seeing everybody next week hopefully on um, you can either bid on our, our website but do go on and have a look um, at the catalogue if you can't personally come and have a look and um, just to thank these incredibly sweet and nice panelists for giving their time and joining us this evening in the celebration of fantastic South African ceramics. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely to see you all. <laughs> <laughs>